Presidential Reconstruction. Reconstruction really is this time period of 1865 through 1877, though some historians actually now are starting to define it as even earlier, starting with like the Emancipation Proclamation and everything. The thing is, when one looks at Reconstruction, there's really no precedent for this era in American history. Never before had states really attempted to secede and then a war followed it. And so when we look at like Lincoln, before he was assassinated, Lincoln really favored, a, quite frankly, a conciliatory po policy in regards to the South. He actually proposed that the seceding states be readmitted if only 10% of pre-war voters took an oath of loyalty to the Union and then they prohibited slavery in their new state constitution. So Lincoln wasn't looking at like requiring states to grant any kind of civil or political rights to former slaves. Whereas we see other Republicans want a much more strict way of handling the former Confederate states. Uh, in fact, we're going to see these more strict Republicans passing the Wade Davis bill that would have required a majority of the state's pre-war voters to pledge loyalty, and they would have demanded that the states guarantee black equality before the law. The thing is, Lincoln actually stopped this from becoming law by using a, what is known as a pocket veto. He just basically refused to sign it. But then Lincoln is assassinated. And so really at this point, we have two issues. Already before Lincoln is assassinated, there's this question of who should take the lead on reconstruction? Should it be the president or should it be the legislatures? And then the second issue was what exactly should the policy be? Well, after Lincoln is assassinated, there's still going to be really two sides to that issue as well. One of the sides is going to be led by Andrew Johnson, who is the new president um, because he had been the vice president under Lincoln. Um, but he is joined in by more conservative Republicans and most Democrats. This side basically argued that technically the Constitution said nothing about secession and therefore the South rebelled, but they never actually left the Union. And there is some truth to that considering, you know, I refer to it as like the so-called Confederacy. But their argument with that was that because of that, they don't need to like officially, I put in quotes, let these states that seceded back in, that they're all still part of the Union anyway. So really, there doesn't seem to be any consequences to that action of trying to secede a, for, you know, the actual civil war itself. Now, the other side was the moderate as well as the more radical Republicans. Now, I use that term carefully because when we look at Reconstruction, there's even periods of Reconstruction that are called like radical Reconstruction and everything. Radicals in Congress that were uh, radical Republicans actually make up about half of Congress at this time. So it, we hear the term radical and we think really far right or left wing and everything like that. But keep in mind, this is still like a huge faction within Congress. So it wouldn't be seen as too radical. It's just when you're looking at conservative, moderate, then the other end is radical. Um, so um, we have our moderate and radical Republicans basically disagree with the first side, they believed more so that the defeated states had basically forfeited their rights. And so like moderates wanted to give some autonomy to the states and limit federal intervention while states satisfied certain conditions for readmission. But radicals wanted to actually go even further and treat the states that tried to secede as basically territories or conquered provinces. So we have all these questions, which finally actually brings us to this slide of presidential reconstruction, which is considered to be 1865 through 67. 
Reconstruction's policy is initially going to actually fall on Andrew Johnson, the new president after Lincoln is assassinated. Johnson is going to do things like extend pardons and restore property rights to a lot of white Southerners who in turn swore oath of allegiances to the Union as well as the Constitution. Um, those who had held prominent posts, sorry, those who had held prominent posts within the so-called Confederacy's government and those who had about $20,000 in taxable property, they had to petition the president directly for pardons. But really this shows just Johnson's disdain for wealthy white people more than anything else. There is nothing under Johnson about voting rights for former slaves or civil rights for former slaves. And in fact, he has a lot of support from the North because of that. Um, a lot of Northern people liked that Johnson was silent on these issues and they were happy that they were bringing back the state so quickly. In fact, some of the Republican party hoped that this might attract white Southerners to their party. Although white Southerners, even with these very, very minimal consequences were not really impressed. Most of the Southern states accepted Johnson's modest requirements, but several of them would object to one or more of them. And the thing is, when Johnson ordered special congressional elections in the South in the fall of 1865, you have an all white electorate basically would vote into office a lot of the prominent Confederate leaders back into American held offices. On top of that, in late of 1865, these newly elected Southern legislatures are gonna revise their antebellum slave codes. They are now going to really expand out black codes. These black codes basically allowed local officials to guarantee that freedmen did not have civil rights. So it's gonna be things like they could arrest a black person who couldn't document employment or document residence or who was considered disorderly in quotes. And then they could sentence these black people to forced labor on farm or road crews. They would restrict black people with these black codes to only be able to work certain occupations. Uh, they barred black people from jury duty. They forbade them from possessing firearms. Uh, they would even go as far as to let judges take black children away from their parents if they could not adequately support them. The problem with that is that really this could have applied to almost every black family in the South during this time just due to widespread poverty. And really this would have applied to a lot of white families in the South at this time. These kinds of actions and the fact that many of the more radical Republicans in Congress felt like the so-called Confederate states had not faced any consequences are going to cause the radical Republicans, remember about half of Congress, to decide that something needed to change. And so they decided that if a state wanted to be readmitted, then the state should have to extend suffrage to their black citizens. That way they could protect freedmen's civil rights. And that the states should also have to officially acknowledge these civil rights like in their governments. The thing is, while radicals decide this, they couldn't really unite behind a program. And the first measure they actually managed to pass was in 1866, they just extended the life of the Freedmen's Bureau that I talked about in the last video. They basically authorized the Freedmen's Bureau at that time to punish state officials who failed to extend equal civil rights to black citizens. The thing is, Johnson vetoed that legislation. At this point, the radical Republicans became a lot more organized and Congress would pass the Civil Rights Act of 1866. This specified 
the civil rights in which all United States citizens were entitled, which would include now freedmen or former slaves. Now, the thing is, Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, but it is still going to become law because Congress is going to manage to muster the two thirds majority needed to override his veto. This is really important because this means that basically Congress can keep freedmen's rights safe from presidential vetoes and thus establish more legislation. At that point, the state legislatures and federal courts are gonna move to put these kinds of constitutional rights in the constitution with the 14th amendment. The 14th amendment basically addressed issues of civil and voting rights it guaranteed every citizen of the United States equality before the law and prohibited states from violating these civil rights. So basically, in effect, the 14th Amendment is outlawing those black codes that were discriminating against African Americans. Now, Johnson was not happy about this. He openly denounced the 14th Amendment. And this actually did win him some followers in like northern states who didn't necessarily want black people to have equal rights, but it also offended a lot of people as undignified of the president to literally go against the Constitution openly. In 1866, Democrats are going to suffer embarrassing defeats in the North when it comes to congressional reelections um, or just elections. And so Republicans are actually going to manage to do better than a two thirds majority in the House and the Senate, which is really important because that means they can continue to override vetoes in the next part of Reconstruction. <laughs> 